We're in Mark chapter 14, verses 52 through 72, and we're looking at the faithful witness, and that's referring to Jesus, and actually we're going to juxtaposition to the faithful witness of Jesus Christ towards us and the lack of faithfulness of Peter towards him. We've seen where Jesus has already told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows, right? But we have not seen that account yet, but in the text before us, uh, we see that now come to fruition, where Jesus, under tremendous duress, like none has ever experienced, uh, he stays faithful and fulfills the mission of God, whereas the best among us, Peter, falls, and, and what we can learn from that. Mark chapter 14, verse 52, we're in the last third of the book of the Mark, and remember, all the last third of the book of Mark is pushing us towards the cross. It's going to end in Matthew in Mark chapter 16 with a highlight of, of Jesus rising from the dead. And then he's going to be proclaimed the Son of God for the first time in this, in this book at the very end where people come to realize that. But, but for now, we're, we're pushing on towards the cross as Jesus steals his heart, his mind, his face. As the book of Isaiah says, sets his face as flint towards the cross. And this is what it says. They took Jesus to the high priest... And all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Verse 54, Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And there he sat with the guards, and he warmed himself with the fire. I think it's interesting right off that, that Jesus is approaching his death. And uh, the best of us, Peter, is sitting back on a nice warm fire. Verse 55, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but even their own statements did not agree. Then some stood and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another made with hands, not made with hands. Yet then their testimony then did not even agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent, and he gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Verse 62, I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he said. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him, and they beat him. Verse 66, while Peter was blowing the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. Then the servant girl saw him there. She said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. And again he denied it. And after a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you're one of them. You are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses. And he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Verse 72, And immediately at that moment the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster cries twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. The juxtaposition of these two things of Jesus' faithfulness on the onslaught of a false mock trial and Jesus' lack of faithfulness when he's warming by a fire, hanging out with people, is pretty, pretty stark contrast. And, and Mark does it on purpose. He's, remember, Mark's account is Peter's account. John Mark is recording Peter's account of the gospel, the life of Jesus. And so Peter's recounting his own great sin against Jesus, but how great Jesus' faithfulness to the Father was. And, and the whole thing drips with the fear of Peter, right? Fear is, is pretty bad stuff. If you've ever been afraid of something, you know how it can, it can cripple us, it can destroy us, or it can encourage us, right? It's both good and bad. It's part of everyday life. It keeps us safe, right? We teach little kids, don't put your hand on a hot stove. Once they do it, they're afraid of getting burned again, and they don't do it twice. 
So it keeps us safe. Fear of being in a car accident tells us to slow down, to wear our seatbelts, to turn on our lights, and to check our mirrors. It keeps us safe. But at the same time, it can paralyze us if we have excess or unwanted fear. It cripples us, right? To where sometimes people are afraid of crowds. They can't go out of their home and spend time with other people, which is something God designed us to do. Or they're afraid to take some medicine that will heal them. Or a number of other things, right? You've heard of them. Fear of the dark. Fear of the dead, necrophobia. Fear of spiders. Fear of dying while falling out of a plane. I think that's a perfectly legitimate fear, by the way. <laughs> you know, whether you've got a parachute or not, it's not natural, right? So fear protects and it cripples. But I remember back in the, the 90s, they had the young guys were coming out uh, at the end of the 90s with these, these shirts and stuff that said no fear gear. It was like what bodybuilders and athletes wore and all that stuff. And, you know, there's no, no afraid. And if you spend time around special forces, you know, they're kind of known. They get all these tattoos that say, I crush all my enemies. There's nothing that can undo me kind of thing. And, you know, you, you, you buck up. You're strong when you're young and you haven't dealt with the hard things of reality and of life. I think as we look at this, Jesus shows us a mature way to handle fear. Because Jesus, I believe, in his humanity, was afraid of what he was going through. He knew what was coming, the cross. He knew the torture and the pain that was upon him. And he knew, and he'd even predicted that it was coming. A healthy, normal man, right in his mind, would be afraid. And yet he controls that fear to fulfill the desires of God. Where Peter... Mr. Brash and Bold, the tough guy. He cut off the ear of the servant when they were arresting Jesus in the garden, and Jesus had to heal Melphus's ear. And, and, and Peter, the tough guy, when everybody else runs away from him, the sheep are scattered, right? He follows Jesus. He's going to be with him to the end. Even when all the others deny you, he says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. And Jesus says, you too will fall to your fear, basically. You'll be crippled by it. And he shows us the immature way that we go about it. So let me give you a couple contexts, okay? First of all, this is the hour of Christ's death. And the redemption of mankind means that he's going to be the sin bearer that we talked about a couple weeks ago of all the sin of mankind. Jesus knows what's coming upon him. His fear, his, his problem with this is not just one that's physical, even though it's definitely that. Crucifixion is a brutal way to be torturously killed. But his fear is not just that. His fear is also relational. All those close to him will, will leave him, but most of all, we talked about the Father upon the cross. My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? That when the Father has to turn away from the sin of mankind, he's all alone for that moment as he bears the sins of the world. But it's also spiritual that the perfect one of Israel, the holy God of all time, the one and only, has to bear the sins of his creation. And so Jesus has this amalgam of all this suffering, physical, emotional, relational, but most of all spiritual, that all goes in together. And why does he do it? Why would a man approach this? Why would a God-man do this? It's because each and every one of you are incredibly him. He would go through the flames, literally, to redeem you and I. He would go to the cross for the point of, of winning us back and our lostness to be with him forever in heaven. And so we know John 3.16 to be true, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? We know that to be factually true, and we've experienced it as believers. And contextually, there's a few other things I want you to see. That this trial is unjust, it's unfair, and it's the worst that the world's ever known. Now, we've seen some pretty bad trials, right? We've seen young mothers with tons of evidence about killing and brutally killing their infant children get off, and we say, that's a travesty. That's horrible. But that's nothing compared to this travesty of a perfect God-man being falsely accused of a number of things. And what about the context of Peter below in the courtyard? We're going to see that the trials of these two guys produced two different kinds of witnesses and two different kinds of confessions. The trial of Jesus, he will finally be the great witness of God that he's always been, but he will finally be the witness. Are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, I am. For the first time publicly, he will proclaim 
his messiahship and reverse the messianic secret that's been going on. But Peter, who's been publicly professing Christ, is going to fall away. And that's the context of what we're going to see. In fact, seven times in this, in nine verses, Jesus will be a faithful witness in one form or another, which is our theme for today. C.J. Mahaney says it this way, We will see the Lion of the tribe of Judah become the Lamb, the little Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. As we move one step closer to Golgotha, to Calvary, to the place of crucifixion of our Lord and our God, I think it's important that we learn a couple of truths, okay? So this first one is that Jesus is the faithful witness. He is our example of how to trust God in the hardest of times. This is verses 53 through 56, right? The Sanhedrin, it says, they took Jesus to the high priest and to all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of law come together. That's the Sanhedrin. There were 71 of them. That's a lot of guys that were leading this place. Doesn't mean all 71 of them got together. We are not sure about that, but it means that the majority of them were together. And what it represents is it represents all the different facets of religious life and political life in Israel. These guys were the leaders, the chief priests, the high priest, Caiaphas is there, the elders, right? Those were the guys who ruled and kind of administrated stuff, the Pharisees, the teachers of law, the scribes, right? All three of these groups are there. The chief priests were made primarily the Sadducees. The elders were made primarily the Pharisees. And lastly, the teachers of the law were primarily the scribes. But all of them are together. And if you remember throughout the book of Mark, as Jesus interacted with these guys, what was all of their interactions with Jesus? What was their reaction to him? They hated this guy. They first tried to discredit him. And then they tried to disgrace him. And as we went through the book of Mark, the first two-thirds, we saw that he moved from discredit to disgrace, to openly saying we wish that he would die. we got to figure out a way to scheme and kill this man because everybody's following him, and he's taken away our power. And that was the issue that they were dealing with. They were losing their political power. Now, what do we know about rulers when you take away their power? How do they react to that? Whether it's the president of the United States or it's a dictator in Africa or it's Putin in Russia. What happens when we start taking away their power? Man, they put the thumb down, don't they? I mean, they start hurting people. Sometimes they start slaughtering people in mass. There's no difference here between these evil humans and any other humans of all time. The Sanhedrin wanted what they wanted, which was to keep their power. Now, they were under Roman rule, but, but they were the highest Jewish authority. But under Roman rule, they could not typically invoke the death penalty on a criminal because that was reserved for Rome, the civil power. And so Rome had to do that. But we're going to see that they, they break that rule too. They kind of manipulate that system. Now look at me at verse 54. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and he warmed himself by the fire. Isn't it interesting that Peter's account given in John Mark says twice, here in verse 54, he warmed himself by the fire, and then again in verse 67, when they saw Peter warming himself, Peter's account of himself is himself kind of hanging out by the fire. Now, last night we bought a fire pit. How many of you guys own a fire pit, right? Or you like a campfire? I mean, what's more warm and cozy than a fire, really? So last night, I broke down, I bought this deep fire pit, put it together, Bought some wood, but like I paid like 12 bucks for like four pieces of wood or something, you know, something crazy. But you know, when you're in that mode to do something for your family, you'll do those things. So I, you know, I buy this wood with Sarah and we, we get the ladder fluid and we kick it on and it's all, we're all gathered around it. And even the dog who's scared to death of the fire, I got the most cowardly dog, I'm telling you. He's the worst. But even he comes over and he's eating popcorn with us. You know, fire is what? It's warm, it's home and hearth. And Peter records himself twice hanging out cozy and warm. He's comparing and contrasting himself with what his Lord is going to do for him. The Sanhedrin are going to unleash everything onto Jesus. And Peter says, and I was warming myself by a fire. His flesh had become more important to him than his faithfulness. And isn't that a picture of us sometimes? Sometimes doesn't our flesh become more important to us than our faithfulness? And Peter's saying, learn from this. Don't do what I did. Learn from Jesus and what he did and see what he did, okay? 
Then the, Peter followed them from distance, right? Then the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for what? For evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did what? In verse 55, they did not find any. So if you don't find evidence, but you've got to make sure that this guy goes to trial, what do you do? You drum it up. You make it up. You fake it up. You do what you got to do to make this happen. And that's what we're going to see. They are scheming, right? This goes all the way back in the book of Mark where in verse, chapter 11, verse 18, it says that they were looking for a way to kill him. We see that all the way back there. In chapter 12, verse 12, it says for a way to arrest him. And in chapter 14, verse 1, they says that they were scheming. In fact, it means literally in the Greek they were looking for a sly way, okay, a sly way to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill him. Now, there's some things we've got to unpack here. These guys bring him together, and they bring false testimony against him, right? They didn't find anything. Verse 56, many testified falsely against him, but even their own statements did not agree. The chief, peace, chief priests in the Sanhedrin, these guys were smart guys. These are well-educated men. But doesn't sometimes our emotions get the better of us? Right? These are guys like with doctorates, right? The lawyers, the doctors, that kind of thing. But sometimes we're in our emotional state, it overwhelms us, and we can't even process things clearly. And I get this picture when I read this text of these guys falling over each other, giving this false testimony against Jesus, but as they're doing so, none of it matches. None of it fits. Their statements disagree with each other. Have you ever seen this in, Houston, in history, where people give false testimony? Maybe in Houston, too. There's some of that going on. <laughs> But have you ever seen this in history where people give false testimony and it doesn't agree? We've seen this before. Many times throughout human history. These people are normal humans, right? Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Verse 56. These religious guys are doing the very thing that they want to engage in. Earlier this week, or earlier today, in uh, Sunday school, we were talking about the Ten Commandments. We are talking about the law, verse of the gospel. The Ten Commandments, they're foundational to our lives and to our Western culture. These guys believe the Ten Commandments were everything, the whole law, all 613 laws. And they knew that the law, the Ten Commandments, verse or the ninth one says what? Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Do not lie. What do we find all these jokers doing? Lying, right? Because when it comes between their faith and their lust for power, which wins out? The lust for power. They're normal rulers, right? They're normal humans. They shuck their faith in favor of what they want, the lust of their heart, right? And so these guys are doing the exact same things. And then they come around and they say, they stood up, verse 57, and they gave this false testimony against him. We heard him, verse 58, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet then even their testimony did not agree, right? All these guys are saying these things, but they're not true. Now, you've got to understand, in that time, to threaten the temple, the centerpiece of Jewish culture, not just religiously, but of life, of Jewish civil law, of Jewish ceremonial law, of Jewish... Uh, religious law of everything, the center of everything was the temple. So to threaten the temple, I guess to put it in today's term, would be like, um, it'd be like you saying, I'm going to blow up the Statue of Liberty, the White House, and the U.S. Capitol. If you went out and made a serious statement like that to the FBI, plan on bringing extra underwear because you're going to be around for a while, okay? <laughs> They're going to put you in a nice little tight room, maybe and turn you in a ship offshore and do all manner of things to you you don't want, okay, to find out more. You're going to get a lot of attention, it's like coming to the TSA and say, I'm bringing ammunition in. Find it. Oh, you're going to get a lot of attention. That's what these guys were saying Jesus was doing. But the question is, did Jesus ever really say that? Did he ever truly say that he was going to destroy the temple? Multiple times before we've seen the book of Mark, he says, this temple, this temple will be destroyed. Talking about his body. It'll be torn down, but I will raise it on the third day. That's not the same thing as saying, I'm going to tear down the temple. So they do the old-handed sinisterness of Satan, right? They take the words of God himself and they twist it. Have we ever seen that in the scriptures before? 
where Satan's henchmen take the word of God and they twist it, right? All the way back to the Garden of Eden. All the way back where Satan in the form of a serpent says this to Eve. Why can't you eat of the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden? Well, God says if we eat of it, we will surely die. And what is Satan's response in the form of a serpent? Did God really say that? You will not surely die. You know, if you eat it, you're going to be as wise as God. And so Satan's people today in this time, 2,000 years ago, are doing the same things as they were 10,000 years ago, all the way back in the garden, the same things that they're doing today. They take the words of God and they twist them. Do we ever see that in our culture today, where people that we interact with as believers, we're believers, they're not, we love them and wish them to know Christ, but in interacting with us, they take the words of God that we tell them and they twist them. Do you ever experience that? Never, right? All the time, right? One of my best friends, who was my best man at my wedding, he totally is against God. He's totally against God. And he knows what I do for a living. And he knows what kind of woman I married and how she loves Jesus. And he spent the whole time up to my wedding five times asking me, you say the word and I'm throwing you in the car and we're out of here. And I said, why would I do that to Kim? Man, if you don't want to get married, don't worry, I'll take care of it. We're gone. Right? That's the kind of guy he is. He's a good guy in many other ways, but he doesn't know Christ. He's lost. He doesn't understand the power and strength of a, wet, of a beautiful wedding and then a marriage of multiple years and, and the strength that that can bring to a man's life. And so all he knows is, is his father having multiple marriages and those not working out. And when it comes to Christ, he has often re, you know, respectfully said, Greg, I understand what you think, and this, that, and the other, but that's nonsense. And then he'll take things that Jesus says and he'll twist that around. Well, God said this. Doesn't it mean this? The world does that all the time and the Sanhedrin are doing the exact same thing. The difference is they know exactly what God said. They had memorized the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, first five books of the Bible, and they knew it inside and out and they're twisting it and they're saying, he said and they knew Jesus' words that he was talking about himself. They knew his explanation, but they said he's going to tear down the temple. They're trying to get him committed for a capital crime. And ultimately, these things come together, and no matter which one you look at, verse 59 or verse 57, whatever it says, their false testimonies did not agree. Now, there's some things you've got to understand legally at the time. When you tried a man, it could not be at night. And the idea was like this. If you're going to try him for a capital crime, if his life is on the line, you don't do it at night because, hey, as the high priest, you're probably exhausted from the day. And you're going to not make good sound judgment. So you can't judge him at night. What do we find here? They're judging Jesus at night. Right after they snatch him from the Garden of Gethsemane, early in the early morning hours in darkness, they bring him to Caiaphas' house. Here's another thing that you don't understand. You tried a man for a capital crime in the temple, in God's holy house, with the idea that God's spirit would give you help with that, where's Jesus being tried? At the house of the high priest. They're multiple along the way doing subtle things to break their own laws and their own traditions, and it's going to cost Jesus his life. The other thing that they did was, if you're going to try a man for a capital crime, there had to be the agreement of two or more witnesses. What does Peter record through Mark here? That these guys said different things and they did not agree. All those things should have made the process stop. But much like injustice in our own nation, the process barrels on because they're going to have their pound of flesh, they're going to have their pint of blood, and they're going to drum it up along the way. Ultimately, during that time under Roman rule, if you're going to try a man for a capital case... The only thing that you could kill him for as a Jew was blasphemy against God. In a minute, we're going to see what Jesus' response is, right? Verse 60, Then the high priest stood before them and asked Jesus, Are you going to answer these men? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. You see, Jesus is not going to answer the foolishness, the dog and pony show. This is a kangaroo court, and he knows it. He knows where it's going. He knows it's going to lead up to the cross. He is God, and he can see the future, and he knows where it's supposed to go, and he doesn't want it to stop because he wants to redeem you and I. 
He wants to give the great faithful witness of God Almighty and to redeem us from our sins. And so he allows it to go on. But this kangaroo court is just out of control. And so instead of answering their ridiculous charges, you know, it's kind of like the book of Proverbs. Do you answer a fool? The book of Proverbs, what does it tell you to do when, you, when a fool questions you? You don't answer a fool or else you might get caught up in his folly. So Jesus is remaining silent. And in fact, he's fulfilling Isaiah 56, where it said that he was silent before his accusers, that he did not strike back, that he did not speak a word, he did not open his mouth like a sheep before his shears is silent. Jesus was silent before those who were going to kill him. In multiple ways, he is fulfilling prophecy. And it's interesting, at the end of this, in verse 65, when they, they cover his head, they blindfold him, and they strike him in their fists, and they say, prophesy. And Jesus is fulfilling the very prophecies that they say they uphold already. Everything that Mark records is dripping with irony. Because here, the high priest in just a moment is going to say, are you the Christ? Again, the high priest says in verse 61, part B, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Are you the Chosen One? Are you the, the Anointed One of God, the Anointed One of Israel? Are you God's Son? Are you that person? And Jesus says what? I am. Now, what is Caiaphas' response to that? Caiaphas says, he says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And verse 63, the high priest, he tore it, means he literally ripped his clothes off. He tore his clothes, not all of them. I don't mean he's buck naked, but he ripped his nice clothes. It was a sign of saying, enough of this. I'll have nothing to do with this. I'm tearing myself apart from this. I'm having nothing to do with Jesus. Now, have we ever seen anything like that happen in our world, where in protest someone tears their clothes? Did you guys watch the Rio Olympics 2016 last summer? If you watched the Rio Olympics, uh, my daughter and I stayed up and watched the volleyball. They were, man, those lady volleyball players are phenomenal. They went gold after gold after gold. The swimmers the same way. But on one night, I stayed up and I watched wrestling. I was just kind of curious, and I was watching it. And if you watch the wrestling at the Olympics of Rio, uh, the Mongolians had one wrestler that was really good. And Mongolia only feels like maybe seven or eight Olympic athletes, not very many. And they never win much. This particular wrestler was really good, and he was wrestling one of the stars, a guy that was expected to get a silver or gold, and he was winning the match, and he was winning in points as they went around and around in time. When the buzzer was sounded and the match was over, after the match was done and the, and the clock stopped at zero, the judges uh, awarded a point to the other man, and the Mongolian lost the bronze. That would have been their first medal in like dozens and dozens of decades. Okay, and so the Mongolian coaches, I mean, they jumped out of their seats. It looked like I thought they were going to strangle the judges. But they controlled themselves, and they made their argument, and the judges would not listen. They would have nothing to do with it, and they awarded the bronze to the other person. And in response, the head coach of the Mongolians ripped all his clothes off down to his underwear. The assistant coach ripped off his, his, his shirt these guys are running around. You can look it up on the net, running around half-clothed in response of saying, this is a travesty. Everybody's seen it. And you could hear the, the, the crowds chant, Mongolia, Mongolia, Mongolia. And at home, I'm on my seat going, Mongolia, Mongolia, Mongolia. And these three judges just, it looked like it was rigged. I'm not saying it was. I'm just saying it looked like that. And they didn't give it to the poor Mongolian. And so he went home knowing that he had beaten this man and had had that stripped from him by these judges that were over him. Jesus is in the same place, knowing that he's going to the cross to save these men. Caiaphas, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes of the law. He's going to his death for them and their sin that they're committed against him right then and there. And they don't get it. The buzzer is coming. It's the sixth hour on the cross, and it'll be, it is finished. We'll see that in a couple weeks. But for now, Jesus knows that the point count is against him, much like that Mongolian wrestler, but much, much worse. Caiaphas turns around and he says in verse 63, as he tore his clothes, why do we need any more witnesses? 
The idea is that he demanded this. Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard him blasphemy. What do you all think? And they condemned him worthy as unto death. This is another one of the high court rules that to be charged in the Jewish court of death, you had to blaspheme God. And because he claimed to be God, they said he blasphemed God. And the very interesting thing is this. The one that's accused of blasphemy is the only one in the room who did not blaspheme. Right? Because these men are denying that Jesus Christ, who had healed people, who had raised people from the dead, remember Lazarus? Who had given sight to the eyes, blind Bartimaeus, and deaf ears back, and had people walk, and he had healed leprosy and the woman with blood, and he had forgiven sins, and he had done all these miraculous things that they saw every single day, and he said, even if you don't believe my testimony about me and what I teach, look at the miracles. Only God could do these things. I am him, and they denied him. They would have nothing to do with him. Are people the same today sometimes? That despite the evidence, they'll have nothing to do with Jesus. Does it mean that they're evil? No, it means that sin has a grip on their lives. These men are fulfilling John 3.19. Light has come into the world, John says. Who's the light of the world? Jesus Christ. Light had come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. These men had a grip on power, and they weren't going to let this sideshow Messiah have any say in it. They were going to have nothing to do with him. They were going to put him to their death, and they were going to make it brutal and public and painful and squash all this right now. And they were going to make sure that this Jesus thing was going to go away and go away badly, and nobody else was going to have anything to do with it. And they have no clue, as they stepped into eternity, that 2,000 years ago, Millions of us would gather around the globe, billions of us, in the name of Christ, that Jesus would continue, and they would not, right? They are the blasphemers, not Jesus, but Jesus is going to die for them anyhow. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him. They struck him with their fists, and they said, prophesy. And the guards took him, and they beat him. And the idea is they didn't just beat him. They scourged him. They brutalized him. Jesus is going to do all these things, but he remains, for the most part, silent. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. He is going to fulfill a prophecy from 700 years later, or 700 years earlier, and he's going to do all these things to make sure that he goes to the end, and this kangaroo court is going to see its will all the way to the end. Now, This reminds me of of something that, unfortunately, I have a tie to in my own history. My mom is from the South, from deep Tennessee. And my mom would tell me about white supremacists that would gather when? Did they gather in broad daylight to do their evil? No, they gathered at night. And what did they do? They used hoods like they put one on Jesus. The difference is... They put one on themselves, sheets and hoods, and they burned crosses in the name of God, and they lynched and burned alive poor black men, women, and children because of their race. You want to talk about a kangaroo court pulling people out of their beds in the dark of night or off the streets and doing evil to them in the woods? That kind of nonsense is not only racism, It is evil in its fullest amount. And when I see this scene right here, it makes me think of the KKK in our day. And in case you think that those things are old and gone, Colorado leads west of the Mississippi and white supremacist groups in the United States. The FBI at any given time tracks 400 white supremacist groups in the state of Colorado. It is alive and well. And it's not just blacks. They go after poor Jews, and they go after whatever group they want to fit in there. At the end of the day, it's nonsense, and it's evil. But what does Jesus do? He sees it through the end, because he knew his mission. He knew that he was doing the will of the Father. He knew that he had to go through all this, endure this suffering, go to the cross, die this horrible death to purchase you and I. Remember, the point is he's the faithful witness to God's plan to redeem humanity for all time. And he's got to see it through to the end. 
And he is demonstrating as a model how we should approach those things. Where else did he say? In another place in the book of Mark, he says, when they come and they persecute you, do not worry about what you will say because the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say it, right? We need to stick fast to Jesus. In our country, that's easy to do. But in other countries, that's not so easy. Millions of Christians are in jail, tortured and mistreated all across the world because of their faith only. Not politics, not anything else, but because of their faith. It is thought that the Soviet Union and their 70-year empire had murdered in one form or another some 20 million Christians of their own people in the Eastern Bloc, the Slavic countries. China is no different today in its communism or Vietnam or other groups. What about the Middle East? Is Islam any easier on Christians? No, they're brutal. I'm not kicking the teeth in on Islam. I'm just saying it's evil what they do to believers because of their faith. Such things should not be done. But Jesus is the faithful witness, and we need to be faithful to the end. It's interesting in the book of 1 Peter. Later on, when Peter's restored, he says this, But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Peter encourages us through the whole book of 1 Peter to participate. Literally means to be in the steps of Christ in his sufferings. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are you when people persecute you, when they say all manner of evil about you, when they kill you because of me. Great is your reward in heaven. We need to persevere to the end. Remember, Mark is writing to a Roman audience under persecution in the first century in the 90s when Domitian's coming on the scene and Nero and those guys, and they're killing Christians, and Christians are being knuckled under. And and Mark writes his gospel, and he says, stick with it, persevere, stay the course like Jesus did. But do not be like this other guy. And then you turn around, and it's Peter. Verse 66, when Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by, and she saw Peter warming himself, and she looked closely at him. You were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he what? He denied it. He denied it. Peter's putting himself out forward saying, Jesus is the faithful witness of how to live your life, to stay your faith to the end, to persevere in your faith. And I, unfortunately, am an example of what not to do I'm an unfaithful witness who abandoned Christ, right? There's a popular saying that, hey man, I got your what? I got your back. How many of you like to have a friend that's got your back? Oh yeah, man, that's, that's, that's good living. Until they stab you in the back, right? Hopefully you guys don't have those friends, but that's what Jesus had. Peter said, Jesus, I got you. I got your back. I'm with you all the way to the end, all the way to the end of the line like Captain America, Right? And then he turned around and he stabbed Jesus in the back. He's close. He can do something about that. He could have stepped into the fray. He could have counted himself among Jesus. And instead his flesh becomes very important to him. Basically the idea is that I'm your friend and I'm watching out for you. But guess what? When the hard times come, I fall away, right? But what did Jesus, I mean, what did Peter say just a little bit? Even if all the other disciples fall away, I won't, right? Verse 29 of the, of the chapter 4, I won't do it. And if I have to die with you, verse 31, I will never deny you. In the same chapter here, well, in verse 50, Peter runs away like a, a hunted dog. As people shine the light on him, he denies that he's there and that he has anything to do with Jesus. He turns tail, as they say. In this first part, chapter 14, verses 66 through 68, he says, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Right? Have you ever had people deny reality, say, I don't know what you're talking about? The girl says, hey, you're one of those. You're the Nazarene. You're with that Nazarene Jesus, right? And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no clue. I remember my brother Ed, who's now deceased. One time my mom was gone in the town, and he got it in the cookie jar. My brother loves sweets, man. I think I love sweets. Man, that guy loves sweets like nobody. And he literally took all these cookies that mom made, these chocolate chip cookies, and he shoved them in his mouth. Just the whole jar. I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, it was like out of control. I thought he had to go to an eating disorder clinic or something. Man, I was just, just shoving them in. Well, right about then, my mom shows up. 
There's the cookie jar with the lid off and crumbs all over the place and on the floor. There's my brother. His cheeks out like a, like a, you know, like a chipmunk. And my mother says, Ed, did you eat any cookies? And what does my 11-year-old brother say? I don't know what you're talking about. As he's spitting crumbs all over the place, right? His guilt is obvious. I didn't know if my mom wanted to choke him or if she wanted to laugh with him. You know, I mean, it was just one of those things. She ended up going easy on him because it was just such a hilarious scene and giving him grace. Peter here says, I don't even know what you're talking about. Isn't it how our denials of things go? I don't know what you're talking about. We hope that'll make it go away with a soft answer. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, right? I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he says. Then he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, yeah, yeah, this, this fellow's one of them. Verse 70, what? And again, he denied it, right? And how does he do that? After a while, those standing near to Peter said, Surely one of them, you're a Galilean. And he began to call down curses, and he swore them. I don't know this man that you're talking about, right? I don't know what you're talking about. In the second part, in another translation, it says, I do not belong to him. So it goes from, I don't know what you're talking about, to I don't belong to him. And then by the third one, it's, I'm cursing, I'm cussing myself and everybody around me, and I'm saying, I got nothing to do with the guy. What are you talking about? Knock it off. You see the, the in, in cursing layers of denial and how his sin kind of consumes Peter and takes him over to where he, a few moments ago in the garden, he wouldn't have been cussing. He wouldn't have been swearing. That was wrong like it is today. But by this time, his flesh is so important, he sees his skin's on the line, his neck's on the line, and he doesn't want to have any, he's an unfaithful witness, so he starts cussing and screaming and carrying on, and I, I don't know the guy. What are you saying? The intensity is what you see in the Greek, is this tremendous intensity where he cusses and he swears and he denies Christ the third time. And then what does the text say? Immediately he heard the rooster crow. And he remembered what Jesus' words were. Before this night is over, you will deny me three times. Before, before the rooster crows the second time, you will deny me three times. And it says at the end of this, he broke down, right? He broke down, verse 72, and he wept. One of the other gospels says he went out. The idea of going out and falling down. The idea of like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane falling down in distress and pain. Peter recognizes what he's done and he goes out and he's falling down and he's distressed and he weeps over his own sin. He gets it. While Jesus was faithful, he was not. While Jesus made the good confession, he did not and he went away from God. But later on, Jesus said, I have prayed for you. Satan is asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that when you're restored, so Peter tells, I mean, Jesus told him earlier what's going to happen. When you're restored, you will strengthen your brothers, right? I wonder if at that moment, it doesn't sound like Peter remembered those words. But we now know in church history that it became true. In the book of Acts, you look in the Bible, Peter becomes the great spokesman, the great preacher boldly going where no man went before. He's the Trekkie, right? The first guy. And he goes out among the Jewish people and he preaches the gospel. In chapter 2 of Acts, he 3,000 people become Christians in one day. What a huge baptismal ceremony that must have been, right? Because it says they were baptized that day. Whew, that's a long day. And he goes on to preach the gospel and the church of Jesus Christ explodes in Jerusalem and in the Jewish culture. Because Peter, when he turned back to God, he was that guy that we're going to see at the end on Easter. He ran to the grave, and he kind of pushed John out of the way, and he goes in, and he sees the clothes that his Lord was wrapped in in the grave with a stone rolled away, and he sees the clothes folded, and he recognizes what Jesus said, that he would rise again from the dead. And then he sees Jesus eating the fish on the seashore and he jumps out of the boat and he swims and he rushes to meet Jesus as Jesus, risen from the dead bodily, is sitting there and eating breakfast for fish for breakfast. And Peter experiences all these things and it transforms him. He becomes a different guy. 
And even though he's been the unfaithful witness, he becomes what? He becomes the faithful witness. He becomes the standout guy along with Paul, the one that God used Peter and Paul to build the church that you and I are part of 2,000 years ago. Now, anything you're doing today, do you think it's going to be around in 2,000 years? Maybe, through your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren, maybe. Not likely. I don't know, I'm not even sure if Delta's going to be around in 2,000 years. I doubt it. I mean, you go to Thessalonica today, it's not much. Ephesus is abandoned. Corinth is abandoned, right? Those, those cities are different. Those nations are gone. Greece and Rome and all those great empires are history. In 2,000 years, forgive me for saying this, but I doubt the United States is going to be here. Who knows what's going to be in its place if Christ doesn't come. But what Peter did when he turned back to God was transformative in his life and so many other people. So what's the takeaway for you and I? If we've been unfaithful witnesses to Christ, and I believe if we dug into each of our histories, including my own, each of us at some time or another has denied Christ either verbally or non-verbally, has kind of abandoned Christ a little bit for something we wanted in the world or for our own skin. Jesus still died for us. He still loves us. He still extends his grace to us. He still knew all those things that you and I were going to do. And he still loved the world so much that he gave himself. Man, that's powerful. The takeaway is this. Our fear should not cripple us. We should be faithful witnesses. But when we fall, when we fail, Jesus' grace is greater still. Can his grace be exhausted? No, two weeks ago I said, he's got grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. His grace cannot be exhausted. It cannot be. It's like the Pacific Ocean. If you take out a handful of water, you're going to keep it for a long time. <laughs> like forever. Right? His, his grace is like the Pacific Ocean. It cannot be exhausted. And he gives it liberally to all those who repent of them, their sins, who turn away from themselves into him. That's the takeaway. We need to be faithful witnesses like Jesus. He's the model. We do not need to be like Peter. He's the antithesis of that. But when we fall, and we will, when we make mistakes, when we do not live up to what God wants us to be and be like him, he gives us grace and forgives us. And we can turn back to him and become even stronger. Peter was much stronger at the end. Church tradition says that they crucified Peter. I don't know if that's true, it's not in the Bible, but church tradition records that Peter was crucified and he requested to be crucified upside down and the reason he said was, I am not worthy to die the same way as my Lord. I am not worthy. What an amazing person he became. And Paul and so many others and even believers today, they do the same things, right? They show us how to be faithful in closing John Steinbeck's novel, The Short Reign of Pippin IV, there's a passage where the king says, power does not corrupt. Fear of the loss of power corrupts, right? And that's what the Sanhedrin were doing. They fear the loss of their power. They are the prototypes of you and I, those of us who are not willing to give up our way of life. Sometimes I believe as, as Christians in the United States, we're more married to the American way of life than we are to Jesus Christ. Now, am I in favor of the American way of life? Absolutely. I love freedom. I love the Constitution. I love the rule of law. I love the balance of power and separations of church and state and all those things. But that, as great as it is, is subservient to Jesus Christ and how we're to live as Christians. And if we've got to choose between one or the other, we need to choose Christ. And so much of the time, we choose things in our own lives that are more important in the American way of life than Jesus our families, our bankrolls, our position, our status, our prestige. But most of the time, it's just simply our comfort, what we want to do, isn't it? It's still the hard line of discipleship. We just like the comforts that we like to do. And so we push Jesus off to the side so we can do those things. We need to live like Christ. We need to live like Peter did when he came back around. A great example of this of living it in everyday life today was a few years ago. How many of you remember Mickey Mantle, the great baseball player, right? That's way before our generation, but 
Mickey Mantle's an amazing baseball player, but if you don't know, he was also known as a hardcore drunk. And when he died, he died of damage to his liver and his body from chronic decades of alcoholism. He was a party animal like nobody's been a party animal. He had a guy on the team named Bobby Robinson. Bobby Robinson was a Christian. And when they played baseball together, Bobby Robinson would say, hey, Mickey, why don't you come to church with me? And Mickey would make fun of him. He called him the milk drinker. You know why? Because instead of a beer in his hand, he always drank a cup of milk when they were together. Mickey Mantle would have his scotch and whiskey, and, and Bobby would have his glass of milk. So he said, no, that's okay, milk drinker. You go to church, and I got some gals I got to hook up with. When he was dying in the hospital over four months, Guess who Mickey Mantle wanted the most? Bobby Robinson. Get me the milk drinker, he said. Bobby Robinson, by this time, had left pro baseball and was a minister, an ordained minister, pastor to church, or had. And he came to the bedside of Mickey Mantle, and it is reported that he stayed there the most over those next four months, spending time ministering to Mickey Mantle. And Mickey had asked him, questions about God because he knew he was impending with Christ and what did Bobby give him see I told you so if you would have just lived this way no Bobby gave him grace upon grace upon grace he was the faithful witness like Jesus to the end Jesus does not strike back at the high priests he does not attack them he does not denounce them he does not put them down he goes to the cross for them Ultimately, we need to be just like Bobby Robinson. Thomas Cranmer, one of the great reformers of the English church, when he was tortured for interpreting the Bible by the Church of England, they took his right hand and they did all kinds of bad things to it. And on one occasion, it was so long and under such duress that he gave in and he, he went against his faith. He recanted his faith. He said, I don't believe in Jesus. As he survived multiple attempts at torturing him and trying to kill him, he became stronger and bolder in his faith. He said he experienced God's forgiveness and his grace. And at the end of his life, when they finally caught up with him and they burned him at the stake, guess what he did? He chose to put his right hand in first as a symbol. This is what I deny Christ with. This goes first for Christ. And it is recorded in church history by the Reformers that as the flames engulfed him, he cried out, oh, my Jesus, forgive them. And he went into eternity. Isn't that what we're going to see about Jesus upon the cross in just the next few Sundays? He was filled with grace and truth. He gave the truth, and when the truth was denied, he gave them what? Grace upon grace upon grace. He loved and he loved and he loved, and eventually the love would win over many then, Remember the soldier at the foot of the cross? What does he say? Surely this man was the Son of God. He was won over by Jesus' love and forgiveness. You and I were won over by Jesus' love and forgiveness. That's what we need to be as faithful witnesses to extend to other people in the county is Jesus' love and grace and forgiveness. And if we're those Bobby Robinsons, if we're those Thomas Cranmers, if we're like the faithful witness of Jesus, eventually God will bring many of them to a saving knowledge of him. Let's pray.